Good morning, everyone. Good morning. It's good to see you. Aren't you enjoying this little fall weather we got? In the morning times, anyway. The evening times. We're back to summertime again, but that's us in South Carolina. But I wouldn't trade it for a thing. It's good to see you here, and it's good to have this wonderful celebration today where we're going to be able to have baptism. We're going to worship the King of Kings. It's his service. Everything we do today. I, I want you to put this filter on it today. Everything that we do in this service, let's filter it to see if it's lifting him up. If it's not, we got to change, make some changes. Amen. Right. Because it's all about him. It should everything we do should point to him and lift him up. And he says, "If I be lifted up, I will what? Draw, draw men to you to himself." So today we want him to draw people. So today let's just welcome the King of Kings. So stand to our feet as we do that. Father, we welcome you, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. Father, this is your worship service. You are the honored guest, and you're worthy to be praised. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Yeah. 
Father, this is the day that you've made. You've told us to rejoice. I really did as I watched that sunshine come up. I, I was taken back to what it must have been like that day when your son come busting out of that tomb alive. And maybe that's why you give us a sunrise every day to remind us that your son rose from the grave. Thank you that there is evidence of you all around. As we look up in the stars, as we see the moon, as we enjoy a cool breeze, as we feel the warmth of the sunshine, all of that is your creation, God. Right? And then, Lord, as we come into a building and we gather as a church and we see people, God, each and every person, specially designed by you, a special creation of everybody in this room, evidence of our awesome God. Thank you. And then, Lord, as we, as we sing the praises to you, as we look at your word, and as we watch some kids get baptized, oh, the, the blessing and the promise that you allow us to change. We don't have to continue to live in sin. We don't have to be bound by our sinful nature and our past. Because of you, Jesus, and what you did on the cross, we can be free. 
Oh, we can be free. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for dying for us. Thank you for coming out of that grave. And thank you for sending your spirit who is here right now with us. And let us listen to you. Let us feel your presence. And let us respond to you as you speak to us. Thank you, Lord, for being a God who is real and present.
know this song. <laughs> I speak Jesus. <laughs> we were joking this morning about like, my mom said, sorry, not sorry, we're doing this song again. But if you um, heard her speak last week or a couple weeks ago, she said that um, she felt like the Lord had told her that we needed to keep doing this song every week, every week until, um, you know, we, we start to see these things that we're singing about and speaking about. And so the song is I Speak Jesus. So if you would, let's stand as we worship him together. Let's sing over those things in our lives. Let's speak Jesus over those situations in our lives, over those people in our lives, those things that are going on that need Jesus, that need his healing touch. And it may be you. It may be your very own heart, your very own soul. When we talk about how next time instead of speaking the negative things, we're going to speak Jesus.
You know, we've been singing that song every Sunday, every Sunday, and up until we press in, take it, take it, take it. But you know what God is saying today? I heard this so clearly. Now it's time to give it. Yes. We know. We know the truth. That's right. Find someone suffering from depression. If you're suffering from depression, find someone. Speak the name of Jesus into their life. And guess what's going to happen? Find someone that's struggling with their marriage. If you're struggling with your marriage, take the name of Jesus to them. If you, find, if you know someone who's full of fear, find someone else who's full of fear if you are. And speak the name of Jesus. Take Jesus to them now that we know. Okay, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Woo. This last song we're going to do is um, Thank You, Jesus, for the Blood. And um, we end it with an old hymn about um, glory to his name. There to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to his name. And that word applied is key here, um, I think, in this song and in the message of this song. And as a teacher, you know, we say this all the time. We play, uh, make sure you can apply what you know, apply what you learn. I think so many times we, we know the truth. We know what God has done for us. And he has applied that blood to our sins and has washed us. But sometimes we forget that it's been applied to our lives or been applied to us. And we have to make that choice to also forget about where we've come from, where God has delivered us from, and keep moving forward in him. And that's what this song is all about. But thank you, Jesus. It's just thanking him for the blood he shed for us, for the gift of freedom and the gift of salvation that he gave us. Thank you. 
Some of these things I used to wear. That's the goal of a Christian. But sadly, some of these things I still find myself putting on. Maybe you can identify with some of my wardrobe. You may have some clothes like that that you wear. 
Last week, if you were with us, we looked in the book of Colossians and we discovered two very powerful statements. You have died in Christ, and Christ is your life. Two incredible statements that should direct our lives as Christians. But two incredible statements that carry with it some things we have to do. Most of my working career, I've had to wear uniforms. Started out with a uniform from Judson T. Minyard Cadillac and Oldsmobile. That was a big emblem right there, because that's a lot of work. I worked for a car dealer in the parts department. That was my first uniform. After a few years from there, I went to wearing brown. For 12 years, I wore UPS brown. You know, it made wardrobe real easy. Brown socks, brown shorts, brown shirt, brown hat, brown coat, brown vest, brown everything. <laughs> For 12 years, I wore brown five days a week, and sometimes just wore it on the weekends. It's just easier to stay with the same color. <laughs> a couple of years after that, I wore a Sherwin Williams blue. And then I wore a uniform for a local pharmaceutical delivery company. You know, while every one of those uniforms looked different, they all carried something that was the same. And that was the moment I put on those uniforms, I represented the company. I didn't just represent myself anymore, I represented them as well. Those uniforms also gave me access to places I could have never gotten to without those uniforms. In the UPS career, I was allowed into some places that had some pretty high security, but as soon as they seen UPS, boom, they buzzed the door, let me ride in. Other people would have to stand and wait, show ID, get frisked sometimes, me, right in the door. My Sharon Williams uniform allowed me to see a tunnel system under one of Greenville's hospital systems, and most people never know how they move medical equipment, and even doctors and nurses, under these tunnels to the other buildings. I was like, this is crazy, this is cool. My pharmaceutical uniform uh, allowed me to carry more narcotics than most people have ever seen in their life and access to pharmacies that are hidden pharmacies because they have so many narcotics, they don't let you know it's a pharmacy. It just looks like a building. And so those uniforms allow me to go in places and do things I wouldn't have normally been able to do. But I knew that when I put the uniform on, I had to put me aside. It wasn't just about me anymore. It wasn't just my reputation on the line, it was also the reputation of the company. Now most of us wear many hats, as the phrase goes. We, we've worked for a company, or maybe we work for a company now, and, and that company has some requirements, and maybe it requires a uniform, and, and we know what it's like to, to be the company person, and do it the company way, even when we think we got a better way. Do it the company way. Last week, those two statements from Colossians. A Christian, that was the audience, a Christian has died <coughs> to themselves. For a Christian, Christ is our life. Now, for us to live the life of Christ, we have to die to self. For us to make sure that that statement is real in our life, that Christ is our life, requires a lot of changes. Now understand that when we come to Christ, give our heart and life to Christ, He gives us the new uniform. He gives us the new life. We can't earn it, but because we have it, there are some expected changes. And because now Christ is our life, we're now following a different way of life than the way of life we had before. And not only are we expected to do things different, we now have the ability to do things different. You see, a Christian is no longer obligated to sin. We are free from sin. A Christian doesn't just want to choose sin. Now they have the ability to choose not to sin. A Christian no longer is bound by the power of sin. We now have all the power we need to be free from sin. Amen. But we got to make some choices. Christ gives us the life. It is both spiritual as the eternal life. 
to live out in heaven, but it's also daily, a daily reality for how we interact and, and, and everything we say, do, and think with everybody around us. But to live out the reality of that life, we got to make some changes. So, what uniform, habit, passion, Desire needs to change in your life. Which one of these things do you need to take off and understand this is not an exhaustive list? Most all of us, if we would be honest, and I appreciate somebody from the praise team this morning. I had these up before they came in. I said, you get to pick your mic. Yeah, who wants to stand by? I'm <laughs> Somebody said, you know, I'm, I'm guilty of all of them. The truth is we are. But which one is the Holy Spirit saying you need to get rid of that now? Put it aside. Be done with it. Don't wear it anymore. You see, something happens when we become a Christian. We now have the ability to stop. We now have the freedom to stop. We now have the power to stop. We just got to choose to change. Okay? We have to choose to change. God has always allowed mankind to have choice. I don't really know why. Because <laughs> we always make bad choices. <laughs> but God has always allowed humankind to make choices, even when he knew they were going to make bad choices. But in Christ, God also allowed us to make a change. Not only do we have a choice, but now in Jesus Christ, we have the power to change. So when we give our heart and life to Jesus Christ, not only has God done some changing in us, he's allowed us to do some changing in us. By the power of the blood of Jesus, by the power of His Holy Spirit in us. We're no longer bound to that old life and that old list of sins. We don't have to live under that. We can make a choice to change and live a different way. Let's pray as we look into His Word today. Father, every Christian in the room, every Christian watching this, you have already given us everything we need to choose to change. When you became Lord and you put your Holy Spirit in us, we had everything we need to change. So Lord, by the direction of your Holy Spirit, let us choose to make some changes today. Lord, for everybody in this room or watching who is not a Christian, they don't realize the chains of sin. They don't realize the captivity they're in. And they're trying to justify a life, and yet today, they have an opportunity to a new life that they never thought, dreamed, or could imagine would be so great. So, Lord, today, they choose Jesus, Lord and Savior, to experience a new life. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Amen. 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 Colossians chapter 3. If you don't have a Bible that you can read and understand, see me after service. I'd love to give you a Bible. Colossians 3, verse 5. Therefore, Put to death whatever is worldly in you, your sexual sin, perversion, passion, lust, and greed, which is the same thing as worshiping wealth. Every time you see a therefore in the Bible, it's there for something. And this is there for us to remember those two statements last week. You have died in Christ, and Christ is your life. 
You see, once we, and so the audience again is Christians like it was last week. Remember that as we go through this because we're going to see some things that's like, oh, really? That's the Christian? Yeah, that's this, the audience is Christian. So once we committed our life to following Christ, once we asked Jesus to be our Lord and Savior, Jesus is our example. He's the one we follow. Therefore, put to death whatever is worldly in you. Now, before we dive into this, I want to make sure you understand what I'm saying and what I'm not saying. Once we come to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, He gives us the gift of the new life. There is nothing we can do to earn it. There is no way we can be good enough. Can't get it that way. The only way is coming to Jesus Christ, confessing our sin, saying, Lord, I want to live for you. I want you to be my Savior. And when we do that, now He gives us the ability to do what verse 5 is telling us to do. Okay? He gives us the ability to choose to change. Therefore, he says, put to death whatever is worldly in you. Put to death is a very decisive action. It's a decision that we have made that we're done with that. We're killing it. It's over. He says, put it to death. What does that mean exactly what it says? His day is over. Put to death. What? What are we to put to death? Whatever is worldly. Now don't forget that phrase because we're about to get a list, and it's just our human nature. We like to go by a list and say, well, I didn't do that, that, and that. Now, don't forget that we have a, a general covering first. It says, whatever is worldly in you. And then he goes on to a list. A list that includes sexual sin, perversion, which is really adultery and fornication, and passion and lust. Maybe some uniforms in our closet. Really, what he is listing here is the sins of desire. They're desires of the flesh. We want. And he even includes greed, because we want more stuff. Maybe one of the greatest desires of the American culture. We want more stuff. And we covet. I want your stuff. So he's saying, guys, put that stuff to death. What he's saying is we need to bring our desires, our sinful passions, under the lordship of Jesus Christ. Amen. Have you ever thought about what Jesus desired more than anything else when he walked this earth? If you read the Gospels, it shows up quite often. The will of the Father. The will of the Father. He says it so many times. Desire the will of the Father. What would change in our life if our passion, our desire, was the will of the Father? More than anything else. The will of the Father. Oh, we got to choose to make some changes. Let's look at verse 6. It is because of those sins that God's anger comes on those who refuse to obey Him. Now just in case, if we thought that since coming to Christ we somehow avoided God's anger, we need to rethink. Yes, coming to Christ brings God's grace and it brings God's mercy and it brings God's love in ways way greater than we can imagine. But God is a holy God. And that's never going to change. And God punishes sinful behavior. He always has, He always will. And just because 
we've come to Christ. Just because we're a Christian, if we don't put to death these worldly sins, then we're choosing a life to live under the anger of God. And I don't know about you, but when I walk through the Old Testament and I see the anger of God display, I really don't want to live under God loved the children of Israel so much. He still does. He done so much for the children of Israel. He probably did more for them than he has any people on earth. And yet, when they chose to go after their ungodly ways, God punished them. His anger was released on them. Is it because he's a mean God? No. It's because he's a loving God who says, Guys, you're living this life, and it's all bad and wrong. I want you to live this life, and you won't listen to me, so now I've got to be a little angry and do some punishment to get your attention. <coughs> so, while we all got junk, we all got sin we got to be working on, and guys, we will until we leave this flesh and move on to heaven. As Christians, we should have some things that we have killed. And we still have some things we're still working on. But if we think we're okay in our sin, then we're not okay with Jesus. If we think we can hold up the grace card and still be in our sin, then there is a problem with us in our relationship. We're going to experience the anger of God. Remember, this, the audience is Christians. Verse 6 is written to Christians. Christians need to choose to change. Look at verses 7 through the first part of 9. You used to live that kind of sinful life. Also, get rid of your anger, hot tempers, hatred, cursing, obscene language, and all similar sins. Don't lie to each other. So he starts off, you used to, past tense. If we've been walking with Jesus for very long, in fact, I think the moment we become a Christian, the Holy Spirit begins to reveal some things that we need to change. In our walk with Christ, we, we should have... No matter how long we walk with Christ, we should have some things we used to do. I'm glad that some of these uniforms I'm wearing them. And we still got stuff we got to keep working on. Okay? But guys, as Christians, we should be on a journey of, oh, that used to be my uniform. I don't wear that anymore. Past tense, not present tense. Used to. I've gotten rid of, he said. Mm. Interesting word here. If you were with us a few weeks ago, you know that the Holy Spirit moved on Paul to use some nautical terms to help us understand what we're supposed to do. What the Holy Spirit is doing in this passage is using some terms around clothing. The idea of getting rid of means to strip off your clothes, take off your clothes, get rid of those clothes. He says you've also gotten rid of. He stripped those things off and he gives us a list. Another list. Not an exhaustive list again. <coughs> Anger, hot temper, <coughs> hatred, <coughs> cursing, obscene language, and all similar sins. Don't just check off the list and realize he's making all similar sins. I, I don't know when it happened. I don't really know how it happened, but somewhere in the journey of humanity, we felt like it was better to make some sins worse than other sins. To be honest with you, the church has done a, done a really good job of trying to do that. So the church is really good at pointing out all those sins of, 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 the, of the flesh, of passion and lust, and how oh man has sexual sins are so bad, without really addressing the sins in the church often, cursing and hot temper and anger. And, uh, see, we, we try to say, well, these are not bad things. I don't know about you, but some of the greatest displays of anger I've ever seen have been in the church. <laughs> some of the hottest tempers exploded I've seen in the church. Guys, this, this list of stuff ain't no better than that other list of stuff. 
And that's why he said, you got to get rid of that. It needs to go. And it was interesting, as I was studying through these, I, I was taken back to just a few weeks ago, just a few weeks ago. And a friend of mine here, he was with me. And then it, and it happened even the week following. I met two people recently. Two people who claim to be Christian and who admitted they had a, a cursing situation. But they were okay with their cussing. Okay? And one of them even went as far as to say, if you don't like the language I use and the attitude I have, you probably need to stay away from me. And he says he's a Christian. I was like, wow. <laughs> Now, again, guys, we all got stuff. We all got sins we're working on, okay? None of us are perfect. Just pick a uniform. We're probably all guilty of one right now. But, again, if we know we have a sin habit and we're okay with our sin habit, then we got a relationship issue with Jesus. Go ahead. It's just a reality. We can't be okay with our sin. be okay with Jesus. Now, it's a journey of discipleship. But when the Holy Spirit says, hey, James, you need to deal with your anger. Guess what? I better deal with my anger. When he says, James, you better deal with your lust. I better deal with my lust. Because the moment I ignore the Holy Spirit, I have now created a problem in our relationship. And I'm okay with my sin. But I can't be okay with my sin and be okay with Jesus. It just don't work that way. That's why we have verses 9 and 10. And that's why the Lord gave us a choice to change. Look at the second part of verse 9, the first part of verse 10. You've gotten rid that person you used to be and the life you used to live. And you become a new person. Okay. We lose some of the, the meaning when we move it to English. But in this original language, this would have very much looked like taking off the old clothes. Taking off the old clothes. You've gotten rid of that old clothes you used to wear. I have a five-step system for my shirts that I wear. When I get a new shirt, I can wear it anywhere, and it hangs in the closet. After I wear it a few times, it gets a few marks on it. It goes to an everyday shirt that gets folded up and put in the drawer. And after everyday wear takes its toll on it, it then gets moved to a garage shirt and gets put in a pile. And then after it serves as a garage shirt for a little while, it turns into a rag. And then after it's been used as a rag, it gets thrown away to be used no more. That's what the Lord is saying to you guys. You've gotten rid of you, you don't use that anymore. That's not you anymore. What's the person you used to be? You've got a new life. You've got an option now. You have gotten rid of it. You've taken that shirt off, never wear that shirt again. You see, this is the cool thing about being a Christian. Being a Christian, we now have an option. We can choose to change. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, we have the power to change. We're not bound by these sins. We're not defined by these sins. They should be, used to be, and if they're not, then we're working on making them used to be, because now we can. Before we became a Christian, we didn't have a new life. We didn't have an option. We were bound by these sins. We were stuck in them. And we didn't have the power in ourselves to get out of them. We just spent our life in guilt and shame and trying to justify doing them because we were just as guilty as the Christian and Christian just as guilty as them. But in Christ, we got a new life. This doesn't have to define us. But we have to choose to change. He says, you've gotten rid of the person you used to be. 
We got two lists in this passage today. One is a list of sinful desires, and one is a list of sinful habits. And that's really the way they're written: desires and habits. And, and they're pretty much displayed on these shirts. And what shirt would you want to be wearing when Jesus comes back? <coughs> choices. You know, we don't have to wait for Jesus to come back because Jesus sees the moment that we put on any one of these shirts at any point in time. And as Christians, we have a choice. And if we want to live out this new life, this new life that Jesus Christ has given us. And he's done both the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. They've done what we cannot do. We cannot pay for our sin. Jesus did that on the cross. We don't even have the power in and of ourselves to overcome these sins. The Holy Spirit gives us that. The Lord has done for us what we cannot do, but he will not do for us what we have to do. We have to choose to get rid of we have to choose to change. And by the power of Jesus Christ, we can. Don't forget lying. It's interesting that in this passage, he put out lying by itself. You know, we're in a culture where, well, it was a little, it was a little while lying. No, it's not. <laughs> Lying's lying. <laughs> I just thought it was interesting that he gives us two lists, but lion gets his own little sentence. Why? Because we like to pass that one off as not a big deal. Man, it, it, it's not okay to have a hot temper and a hot attitude towards your wife and kids. Man, we don't prove our manhood by cussing and telling dirty jokes. Women, you don't prove you're a woman by being the queen bee. I'll put people in their place. Is that what we want to be known by? Is that the uniforms we want to wear? Christian, we have a choice. And if you're not a Christian, look, he brings up the new life again. You can have a new life where this stuff is in your past. You've got to get up in Christ. we got a choice. We can change. And look what happens when we do. Verses 10b and 11. This new person is continually renewed in the knowledge to be like its creator. Man, I almost just waited until next Sunday to handle that one sentence because it's so cool. <laughs> Verse 11 where this happens, there is no Greek or Jew, uncircumcised or circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, uncivilized person, slave or free person. Instead, Christ is everything and in everything. This new person is continually renewed in the knowledge to be like its creator. Short person, we're growing every day more like Jesus. There's something taking place in the life of a Christian that every day we're being reminded just like I talked about the sun coming up. Man, I know, most of you don't want to get up at sunrise, and I'm not a big fan <coughs> of it either. But when you look at the sun out there, don't just think about the S-U-N. Why don't we be re reminded, renewed of the S-O-N, the Son of Jesus, or the, son of Christ, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who died for us. Be renewed in our minds. That's what the Word of God is so powerful to have in our lives every day. That's why we need a small group of people. Man, Wednesday night, we had our small group back there of men, and we talked about baptism. Lord, so it was so cool. Because we need a small group of Christians. We do life together. See, that's why we need accountability. Because those two lists of sinful desires, sinful habits, they are hard to break. Habits are hard to break. 
We need help in breaking those habits. That's what he means here. You need to be daily renewed in your knowledge of God. And we need people reminding us of that. Yes, we need the Word of God. Man, we talked the other day about how many things we can put on our phone to remind us to read Scripture. Just those things remind, renewing our minds, thinking on God. Because the thinking on God, we're growing in Christ's likeness and we're not getting back into this stuff. Every day, we need that renewing. We need accountability. I had a friend of mine, their family had a cursing problem. And so they put out a cussing jar. And every time somebody in the family cussed, they had to put money in the jar. Fine. We need stuff like that to break bad habits, guys. Because some of these are bad habits. They're not, hard. They're not easily broken. We need help. We got Jesus. We got the Word. We got the Holy Spirit. And sometimes we need help in the flesh for somebody to say, Hey, how you been doing with your attitude this week? I was sharing with the praise team. There's a lot of things helped me on my journey, but one of the greatest things that's helped me in dealing with some of these things in my life is to have an accountability partner that i got to talk to them every week about an issue in my life. Ooh, I don't want to have to tell somebody that I've been dealing with cussing or sexual. I don't want to. Why? Because I don't want to admit I failed. So guess what? That straight me up. One minute. I mean, that got me going. But here's a cool thing that happens. Verse 11 is really neat. Because verse 11 shows us something. It almost doesn't look like it fit, but it really fits beautifully. What he's saying here, guys, is, is when we become this new person, when we make a choice to do away with that, we become a new person, the walls between us begin to fall down. See, we got walls between us. It's called prejudice. And our prejudice, they're actually the result of some sin in our own life. We think there's something wrong with that other person. The reality is it's a sin in our own life. And when we begin to be renewed in our knowledge of Christ, and we choose to make some changes in our own lives, in the sins of our own life, we begin to see, my sin, their sin, ain't no different. My sin, their sin, we both need the same Savior, Jesus Christ. They ain't no better, and they ain't no better than I am, and they, I ain't no better than they are. You see, it begins to change how we even view one another, and walls begin to come down. That's what Paul is saying through the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, there's no more division when you begin to work on your sin, because we go back to what we like to do. We like to make somebody else's sin worse than our sin. And when we begin to do that, we begin to build a wall up. That old person, they're a drug addict there on the street, and you know, I'm better than they are. Really? See, it doesn't just change us when we make a choice to change. It begins to change our entire culture. Because we no longer have the divisions that sin creates in our culture. And then everything becomes one in Christ. Which is what the goal is anyway. In Christ, everything. So we... I have a couple of lists in here today. Not exhausted list. One of sinful desires, one of sinful habits. Christian. We need to get rid of today. We need to put to death today. <coughs> what do you need to take off to say, I'm done with that God? No more. Maybe it's been hanging on for years and years and Christian, the Holy Spirit has the power to free you from that sin, but you've got to make a choice. If you're here today and you're not a Christian, you really are living under a life of more bondage and more depression and more darkness than you realize. But we try to justify it as well, we're not as bad as. We make a choice to experience a new life, a life like you could never dream or imagine how great it is when you choose Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Would you stand with me as I pray for us?
Jesus, I thank you so much for what you did for us. When you walked this earth, you showed us first how to live. You showed us that you dealt with every one of these temptations, every one of these. You were tempted in every way that every one of us are. But you had a greater desire, the Father, the will of the Father. And today, Lord, we need to make that choice. We want the will of the Father more than anything else. More than where our feelings take us. More than where our, our, our logic takes us. More than where our past wants to take us. We want to follow you, Jesus. If you don't know the new life, oh man, today, you got a chance at a new life. So Lord, I pray that each and every one of us in this room would choose to make a change because every one of us need to make some changes. There's some men in the back. I'm over here at front. This altar's open. There's a cross in the back if you just want to go to the cross and pray. Whatever you need to do to get rid of
Amen. Thank you for that, Lord. We like to treat these days as a wonderful celebration for baptism. So feel free if you want to move over here. You don't have to be sitting in a seat. You can be on squat on the floor, whatever you need to do to see these kids get baptized today. We are so proud of them. Please make your way over if you want to see better, if you want to get some pictures and all that stuff. And after they're baptized, we like to scream and yell and celebrate and clap and all that good stuff because it's a celebration. Amen? Amen? They are making a profession of their faith that they are joining us as brothers and sisters in the kingdom of God. Nothing better. Let's celebrate. Yes, as Leah said, this is a celebration. You can hoop, holler, take pictures. Uh, you're welcome to even come over and stand, just kind of not block our cameras because some people are watching live and want to see it as well. And so these kids, each one of them I've taught with and others have taught with, and they have shared that they have given their heart and life to Jesus Christ. This is not what saves them. This is simply telling the world they have been saved by Jesus and they're following him in baptism. And Jill, I know sports camp is a lot of work. But you know that all three of these kids came to know the Lord through sports camp. Amen. Yeah. God is doing a really cool thing through a bunch of sports as we share Jesus with them. This is Ellington, and I had a great time talking to Ellington Thursday night, and this young girl really impressed me with her answer. She said she had already been loving Jesus, but during sports camp, she knew she was going to pray to Jesus for the forgiveness of her sin, and she has walked through a baptism book just, and I love the question. She had one question for me, and she stumped the preacher. She said, why is the gates pearls in heaven? I don't know. <laughs> but I'm looking forward to seeing them, right? They're going to be really cool, ain't they, Ellington? They're going to be shiny and pretty. Oh, Ellington, because of your faith in Jesus Christ, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This is Ryder. And Ryder came to church one Sunday. I don't know when it was. It's been a while back. And he says, God will meet you that guy. And he was confident, assured of that. And so we've had a good journey of talking and his journey with the Lord. And uh, here's the neat thing between him and Colton. Him and Colton are friends. The guy's going to be baptized next. They've been on ball teams together. They've been in sports camp together. And me and Alan was talking to Colton's daddy. Those are, those are not things of accident. God put them together. Why? So they could walk this journey of coming to know Christ with a fellow brother in Christ. Yeah, they're kids, but they're brothers yeah. in Christ. Share real quick. Um, like Jack, Pastor James said, the journey with these two little boys um, start playing ball together when they were little. I mean, three or four years old. They're nine now. They're playing on each other's team and against each other. 
And I, I believe what James said, that God doesn't just put people in each other's lives by chance. That you do, you're do you on a journey together, and it's up to us sometimes to speak life into these kids. Beautiful thing, Ryla, one time I was coaching in soccer, and I said, Ryla, what was your, I asked all the kids, I said, what was your favorite thing about this year? And some kids said, oh, the snacks. Some kids <laughs> said, yeah, that was their favorite. Some kids said, oh, well, I like when we win. Some kids, but Ryla said, I like that we prayed before our practices and our games. And I knew right then that this kid was very special, on a special, different journey than other kids his age. And uh, Jill, thank you for sports camp. Because there's they were, they got another friend here, Boston's here, who also dedicated his life to Christ in that moment. And then they have another baseball friend back there at Easton. I know he's close to baptism. He's on a journey. So through sports, guys, we can still minister to these children. Amen. And this little young man right here, my son. I'm gonna try to get through this without being emotional, but you know my story, you know my testimony. Some of you got a lot of you guys knew me before, right? When I was still living in sin. I wasn't changed. I didn't dedicate my life. I, I mean, my dad's up here because I asked him to come up here. When I was a saint, my dad taught me about being a Christian and how I should live, but it took something, it took my little boy coming to my life, and Colton coming to my life. According to our life, um, he experienced a traumatic experience. He quit, he quit breathing on us in the hospital several times, and I couldn't figure out what was going on with him. And that moment in my life, if you knew me then, I was addicted to alcohol. I was addicted to all this other sin in my life. And in that moment, based on my foundation, my dad gave me, I knew that there was only one answer to free my son from what was going through. And that's why I hit my knees and I told God, I said, if you, if you saved my son, I'm going to dedicate my life to you. So I feel like this is a reflection of that moment to watch my son now dedicate his life to Christ. So thank you guys for joining us. Yeah. Pretty special guy in my life, too. Angie kept kids for a lot of years, and Colton was one of them. And he had to run to my office to get away from the girls. <laughs> I told him to come on. Get away from the girls. But we, uh, we developed a special bond, and this guy became my right-hand man. In fact, he helped me paint it room back here in the church when he was, I don't even know how old you were, but you was pretty young. And his granddad is here because his granddad has been a very, very huge part of his spiritual journey. As, as we always have people, God places in our lives for that journey. But this guy's been, um, we talked Wednesday night, and he says he knew he accepted Christ. He was waiting to grow in it. And he's been growing in it. And he's going to keep on growing in it. Amen. Amen. You can remember all three or pick one. Pray for these kids. In fact, we're doing something with these kids that we haven't done before because what we're seeing is a lot of times people get baptized and then Satan distracts them so bad because Satan is not happy with the decision these kids made today. And he's going to come on. And he's going to come on your parents too because he don't like us making a statement for Jesus. And so I'm asking you to pray, encourage. If you know them, stop by, send them a text, hug on them, say I'm so proud of you, but keep praying because Satan will cut loose on them. And, and we don't want that on them and we don't want it on us. So let me encourage you to please remember them in prayer. Go out and make the choice to live for Jesus. And watch how it changes you. And everybody around you. I love you guys. See you soon.